so technology, robots in spine surgery, is this hyper-reality? So this is like everywhere. Robots, robots, robots. Um, it's kind of finally approached the world of neurosurgery or spine surgery and orthopedics as well. Uh, everywhere you look, everybody's talking about robots. So I thought I would just kind of talk about this and see where sort of where we were and figure out if it's hyper-reality. I've been doing a lot of evaluations of the robotic platforms that are out there for the last year. Uh, there's a lot of companies that are coming out with these. I, I'm not mar married to anybody or anything. Just going to sort of give you the uh, information as to where we sit today uh, in spine technology. So hyper-reality. So MIS, million invasive spine surgery, is sort of the buzzword. You know, that's the buzzword that came out right before robotic surgery. Everybody wanted MIS, minimally invasive spine surgery. Why? Because there's so much stuff that you could do it. So we all know by a lot of data that's out there, regardless of what kind of field we're talking about, general surgery, plastic surgery, orthopedic surgery, if we can get patient outcomes to be better, that's what we all ultimately want. And how do we achieve that? Well, we've shown good data with smaller scars, which means shorter hospitalization times, like I was alluding to before, so less blood loss, less risks to the patient in general. The patient recovers faster. They have less pain. Uh, this says less blood donation, which I don't think a lot of patients do. But in general, they have a quicker return to normal activity. So if we can achieve all of these things, that's the ultimate goal for everybody. This is where the robotics world is headed. Okay, can we achieve this even more with robotics and platforms? Does anybody know what Scott's parabola is? This is a very famous thing uh, that was published a long time ago. We always talk about this in the field of technology, especially in medicine. So on the left side, and this is a very small slide, somebody comes out with this promising idea. Hey, listen to this great idea I've got. So people talk about, well, there's some possible value here. We don't have a lot of great research on it. So we kind of talk about that right here. So the great idea starts here. We talk about sort of the implications of where we are with patients. We get a couple great encouraging reports. So some people start talking about how great their patient outcomes are, a couple case reports here and there. And then the media starts to adopt it. They sort of figure out, hey, this is kind of the hype. Time Magazine picks it up. You start having these pictures on the front of it. It gets introduced to more and more surgeons and the public. They start learning about it. Next thing you know, it becomes a quote unquote standard of care. So everybody's got to start utilizing it in their surgeries and their field. And then, unfortunately, people start to develop a little bit of uh, doubt. They're not sure what's going on. Somebody does a report and figures out that it's actually not as good as it was. And then there's one really bad outcome. And then there's a lawsuit. And then it goes away. All right, that's Scott's problem. It's very common with a lot of technologies. And back in the day, it was the cage rage where everybody's putting in cages everybody's spine. And we found out that was not the right thing to do for people. So we've been through all of this before. And then people like V talk about the olden days of how they used to do it with just a, a C arm and a, and a rusty nail. <laughs> this still does, see? Um, for those of you who think that Lee Nelson works hard, this is him in his office. Um, I share a clinic with him on Thursdays. This is him about 12.30, 12.45 after lunch, um, trying to gather himself from that post-food coma. So we have different generations of uh, robots that have come out. So it's not that robots are brand new. They've been around for a long time, OK? So actually, in the 90s here, there are a lot of robotic uh, platforms that came out. And these are a lot of different companies here. This is the RoboDoc over here, the Caspar. This is uh, an, in, in some, some sort of random Swedish robot out here. This is the Mako Zcat robot. So, these are a lot of different robots that came out in the 90s. Again, so robots have been around for decades, OK? But the problem is we've never been able to achieve anything that's been usable from that perspective. Second generation robots came out in the 2000s here. Um, I'm going to show you this device actually here in a minute with a video and uh, a couple other ones here. So these are both orthopedic and spinal applications for these robots. They look pretty archaic. Remember what the old IBM computers used to be? A room full. Now we got a little iPhone. So this is kind of what that looks like, right? They're old and archaic. And that's OK. That's kind of where the platforms have gone. Now we're at sort of a different place in robots and technology in general. And there's different classifications for how you can define a robot, OK? There's one that's a supervisory controlled, which means that the surgeon plans the operation and the specific motions. And then the robot itself will actually perform those specific motions autonomously with the surgeon uh, direction, okay? And then you have tele-surgical, which is like the da Vinci robot, which we do not use in spine or neurosurgery, but the general surgeons use it a lot. And those are a little bit different where the surgeon is actually utilizing and controlling the robot itself through um, hand controllers. It's almost like, um, like a video game from that standpoint. And then there's shared control, which I've actually heard the terminology called a cobot instead of a robot, okay? Where the surgeon and the robot actually will control the surgical instruments at the same time. 
And that's kind of where we're talking more so from our field. So the DaVinci is something that everybody knows. I've actually never used the DaVinci because it's a different field from our standpoint. But essentially, Intuitive came out with this device. It got FDA approved in 2000. It is not utilized for spinal instrumentation at all, which is why we, I don't know anything about it. But what they do is laparoscopic approaches in general surgery. So the surgeon sits behind a console and there's several robotic arms. I think there's three or four different robotic arms there that they can control. I don't know what she's doing, but he's controlling the machine over here and he's suturing, opening, holding things out of the way. So that's a, that's a robotically controlled arm right there. Okay, that's the Da Vinci robot, which everybody seems to know. With the Da Vinci, they performed an ALIF, so an anterior lumbar interbody fusion. It's a procedure that we do to get to the front of the spine through the abdomen, okay? So you move the peritoneal content sideways and you do essentially a discectomy fusion. That's called an anterior lumbar interbody fusion. So they figured, hey, if we can make the smaller incision for the ALIF to do the surgery, people get uh, better faster. And some of you guys have seen these. So they did actually a laparoscopic ALIF in 1991 and they performed it with the Da Vinci robot and they didn't show any real advantages over doing just an open procedure with regards to blood loss, time in the OR, skin incision and things like that. And there was a huge steep learning curve for the surgeon to be able to learn this device. Okay, so over the years they just kind of said, well, didn't really help, just lengthen the OR time. So didn't really make a huge difference. Um, there was another study that was published in 2013 and 2011 small case series again these are not level one evidence but people published their results and said hey the da vinci for alifts had a great sort of dissection of the tissues and they didn't injure the kidneys or anything like that most good surgeons wouldn't do that anyway so kind of take that for what it's worth so it's kind of fallen out of favor even though people were doing that scott's parabola people are talking about it people don't really do it anymore the Spine Assist robot uh, in 2004 came out. Um, this was the first dedicated spinal robot to have come out there. Um, and what they found at that time, it had less than two millimeter average uh, deviation from, so if you think about a pedicle screw and what you're putting into a uh, space, what does two millimeters mean? Well, if you're putting something within a pedicle in the spine, you only get a few millimeters of deviation. So this less than two millimeters is pretty, um, pretty good and pretty important from our standpoint. And compared to fluoroscopy, which is the way we do with C-arm and the olden days, like V did it, um, there were uh, non-displaced screws were higher with fluoro compared to the robot, okay? So this is actually what this looks like. I'm gonna try to see if I can play this video. For your patient safety. Whoa. Surgery with Mazzol Robotics Spine Assist Guidance System involves four basic steps. Starting with planning, surgeons use Spine Assist software to create a pre-op blueprint of the ideal surgery for their patients. Based on the patient CT scan, Spinosis advanced planning software reconstructs a virtual 3D environment in which the surgeon plans the ideal surgery. Its user-friendly interface provides surgeons with powerful features to optimize implant size and placement in each vertebra or other procedures such as vertebral augmentations. To enhance the procedure's safety, the pre-op surgical blueprint can be reviewed with Spinus's unique software, all prior to entering the operating room. Mazor Robotic Spine Assist has several mounting options, including bed and clamp mounts to support different minimally invasive and open surgical procedures. In the operating room, the mounting system is rigidly attached to the prone patient to assure that maximum accuracy is maintained throughout the surgical procedure, even if patient movement occurs. Once the mounting system is in place, a unique fiducial array is attached to mark its location relative to the patient's spine. Two fluoroscopy images are taken, an AP and oblique views to automatically match the exact location of the mounting system relative to the vertebrae in the preoperative CT. The images are quickly processed by the software and registered to the CT so the mounting system is matched and synchronized with the surgical blueprint. This mounting and 3D synchronization process usually takes 10 to 15 minutes. With the surgical blueprint matched to the anatomic location of Spinus's robotic arm, the surgeon selects a target vertebra from the preoperative plan. This action sends Spinus's into position to guide the surgeon's tools and implants with the highest level of precision for each desired placement. This process continues until all implants are safely placed in their pre-planned location with one millimeter accuracy.
So the, the challenge that came out with this, we actually evaluated this technology years ago. And as you can actually see, it's labor intensive, so, right? I mean, you just watching this, and you're like, oh my god, when are you going to get to the surgery, right? There's four steps to actually get to the surgery. No way. That's, that's way too time intensive and wasn't worth the value back in the day. But you can see they were getting close to getting to the point where we had accuracy and, and value. So the Renaissance robot um, is another uh, robot that, come out, that came out, uh, approved in 2011 by the FDA. And the accuracy was, uh, was better compared to conventional. So I think you're going to see in general, typically, the robot's going to have more accuracy than conventionally placed screws. I, I don't have to keep saying that every single time. But this is where we are getting to with the, with the point of the robot. The Mazor X is a Medtronic spine robot. Um, it received FDA clearance in 2018 for spine. Um, this is the, their latest version out here. And you can actually see they've re reduced it from four, uh, four to three steps here. And I think that there's a video here for this one as well. A Mazorex procedure begins with the attachment of the surgical system to the bedside rail. Depending on the clinical indication and surgeon preference, one of the platforms is chosen and attached to the patient's spine. Step 1. Scan. Before the intraop 3D scan is taken, the 3D marker is placed on the surgical arm using an extender. A 3D scan of the patient is taken and uploaded to the Mazorex system software. The intraoperative 3D scan is used in place of a preoperative CT scan. Step 2. Plan. The surgeon plans the ideal procedure for the patient using the Mazor X system's 3D planning software. The planning software interface allows the surgeon to review and modify this plan in axial, lateral, and AP views until fully satisfied with the location and purchase of the implants. The surgical plan can be reviewed in a virtual video mode displaying the anatomy slice by slice in all three anatomical planes. Step 3. Operate. Once the surgeon's plan is complete, the surgical arm is sent to the plan trajectory, allowing the surgeon to instrument with precision. This process continues until all trajectories have been executed and implants are placed in the planned location. With scan and plan, Surgeons can experience the same benefits of a Mazor X spine procedure with the added. Okay, so that's that. I just want to show you that because you can understand how the robot's now evolving a little bit faster, shorter steps with that. And what's actually now better is the sort of the planning softwares that have come out. So you can start to actually uh, calculate your screw lengths and make them really sort of customized to the individual pedicle. So as you can imagine, the patient's anatomy will be variable with regards to how big of a screw size diameter you can put in in length. So rather than just being the standard screw size, we can put in more customized screws from that standpoint. The planning is better. The other thing that helps us is with the planning software in general for almost all these platforms, you can try to see where all your screws will be placed in a multi-level fusion surgery. So if you can do like a scoliosis patient or a multi-level fusion, if we put in our screws, what happens is if you start deviating your screws to say, I need this trajectory to be a little bit more ideal than not, Sorry. Rise on call. Um, so what happens is you actually can plan so that if you optimize your screw trajectories, um, you can first of all, you can plan your skin incisions, where you're going to be if you're going to do an MIS type procedure. But also, if you're going to be doing a rod that you need to contour, you figure out that at the end, your screws are actually lined up rather than having one screw that's off and then trying to contour a rod, which is very hard to do when it's made of titanium or cobalt. And you have to sort of spend all this time at the end of the case when you're exhausted trying to get that rod to fit. So the power becomes in these kinds of pre-planning softwares. Does that make sense? You customize it and you make sure that the surgery actually goes a little bit easier and better compared to what it used to be. Does that make sense? Because then you have to sort of deal with this at the end of surgery after you've already placed all your screws. Uh, the Rosa robot um, is, is uh, was by MedTech Surgical, but I believe has now been bet by uh, Biomet Zimmer, which is another big uh, hardware company, a lot of orthopedics and now spine. Um, they're mainly for uh, joints, so uh, hips and knees and things like that. And they're coming out with a spinal application as well. And what they actually have the ability to do is dynamic tra tracking of the patient in real time on the table. So again, each iteration of the robot is getting better and better with regards to the accuracy and what we have to do intraoperatively. 
Um, this is what they call with a dynamic guidance. So if the patient moves or anything like that on the table, the robot can detect that movement, okay? And that's really important for accuracy because if a patient moves and you have your screw placed over here and the patient moves a couple millimeters this way, you're gonna shoot that in the wrong spot. So now you can actually track that and more accurately place the screw. Does that make sense? So again, a slightly better iteration than what we had before. Uh, the Excelsius GPS is a Globus medical uh, device and they got FDA approval in 2017. And some of the drawbacks that were there from the previous, um, uh, previous uh, robots has been improved upon again. And the reason is what they do is they actually allow uh, for multiple options for the uh, patient tab registration. So you can do a preoperative CT, intraoperative OR, or an intraoperative fluoroscopic scan. Their arm actually, uh, they'll probably show a little bit as a multi um, sort of, you can change it to multiple different devices to be able to use, so a drill holder, things like that. So one sort of click on, click off. So the arm is now has multiple uses and multiple purposes there. And you can see that here with the uh, surgeon that's doing that, and you can drill uh, much better. So the accuracy, again, um, is even high. And we already know that now as we get through all these robots. He's staring at this very intently. It kind of creeps me out. <laughs> Nobody does that in the OR, by the way. It's like a creepy actor. So that's what it does. So essentially, it's moving in place and is dynamic tracking. And then you just shoot your drill, shoot your screws in. Okay, so again, these are the things that are becoming better and better. Uh, we already talked about radiation exposure reduction with the robots, um, customized plans for the uh, patient, which increases our efficiency um, for the patient. It improves your subtle and time variations that we have to sort of deal with on the fly, usually. Uh, increase accuracy and safety of the uh, instrumentation for our patients. We can do more MIS procedures that we couldn't do before um, and, and much more comfortably. And they're actually showing that are reducing our OR time because you don't have to spend this time exposing the patient, doing your hardware, and then closing the patient. If you do MIS, you have small incisions which close very quickly from that standpoint. And of course, hopefully reducing the overall complications, which is the goal. Um, you know, this is an example of good robot, um, you know, the Roomba. But we have, unfortunately, limitations with what our robots can't do today. So you say, well, it's, it just is kind of a really expensive arm, right? Well. What are the things that we're looking to in the future and what's going to probably be coming out? The ability for actually the robot to be able to just drill and screw for us, right? Like I just want the robot to put the screws in for me so I can sit back and drink my latte. I want it to contour the rod for me when I'm tired at the end. I don't want to spend all the time contouring the rod. I want it to do it for me at the end. Can it do a decompression for me? Just go in there and zip, 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 open it up and take the bone off. Can it do the fusion for me? So these are the, the things that we're going to look, look to the future. Can't have the capability today, but it's probably coming out very soon. Um, these are some of the papers out here. Again, these are very small numbers here. Uh, sorry to tell you, but in general, accuracy of robotic screw placement is high. Okay, it's very good in general. And again, now the, 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 the data is actually coming out, and this is where the power of data analytics comes. So what's happening here is a robot shot one dart, landed right there. It did a quick analysis of the board, and you're going to see the next four darts land. Bingo. Okay. So machine learning, AI, all that stuff is coming. So not only do we want to be able to place screws accurately, we want the robot to be able to do things, predict, where am I going to put my screws? What does Roch Paul typically do? This is what he typically does. This is what the patient needs and start doing that. I know it's scary, but this is where you start to get into stuff that's kind of cool, actually. So this robot missed once, analyzed the board, and hit the next floor in the bullseye. And that's what you couldn't see. And that was machine learning off one shot. So, this just came out um, in 2017, and again, there's more paper and data coming out because the robotics platforms hadn't been around for a long time, so we don't have enough cases to report on. That's what everybody wants, is good data and literature. If you start in 2017 or 2016 with getting data, you have to follow those patients to show long-term outcomes. So we don't have great lit literature and data at the moment, but it's coming. And these are some of the individual papers that have come out there. And really what they're showing on the right side there, there's almost close to 100% accuracy with all these different small studies, case series, longer case reports with screw placement. It does range all over the place. One's a 92%, but most of them are 96, 97 to 100% screw placement with the robotics platform. Okay. Um, accuracy of open versus uh, uh, percutaneous screw placement. Um, you can see here uh, the revision rates. This is for conventional um, patients, uh, incidents of a problem there um, uh, with breaches is still real. Okay. It's happening when people try to freehand it. So I think the days of saying I can just do this with a CRM and Flora are going away as we accept the reality of the fact that we have stealth and robotics platforms. Um, 
I'm not going to go through this one. This is robotics versus, pla um, robotics versus freehand. Robotics is RO. Freehand is FH. So if you look at the complication rates, robotics is less than freehand. And the number of revisions for robotics versus freehands is less. Okay, this is not my data. This is just the data that's getting published slowly and slowly. Okay. Um, let's see here. In the interest of time, radiation exposure, I already talked to you about this. Um, one of the things that we talked about, for this is for uh, one thing we have to be cognizant of, this is in pediatric idiopathic scoliosis. So if you have a patient that needs 12 or 13 or 14 levels fused and they're a kid, all right, we can treat them with a brace, which obviously over time has much less radiation exposure. Now if we take them to surgery and a surgeon like me uses an intraoperative device which exposes them to radiation, it's not trivial. They showed that these patients had way more radiation exposure for their procedure. So again, it's not a zero-sum game for us just to do these devices, especially for kids, because we talk about long-term implications for cancer. That's important to understand that. Um, and these are actually um, slides that I already had in there, but I already gave you the radiation talk, so we won't uh, necessarily go through it. I already talked about the Bindel paper before, um, and this is, a, um, this is an overall systematic review, which is not a lot of papers out there of fluoro versus fluoroscopy, and they did five studies comparing robots to fluoro, and the duration of surgery was not that significant, obviously because robots were still learning how to use the robots to make things more efficient and faster, um, but they did find the radiation exposure was less in robots compared to fr uh, freehand, which is what we've been talking about. Um, there's always this uh, learning curve aspect of it, and this is Lee Nelson trying to um, load a dishwasher. Um, it took him a couple tries, I was watching him, but he had Mike Kiley, his right-hand man there, helping him out, so I think we got him done okay without breaking him. Oh, it's a video? Well, that's even gonna be more of a disaster. I don't think it is. There he is. Yep, look at the size of the plates, it's awkward. What, he's, what is he doing? Yeah. Yeah. He's never loaded a dishwasher in his life. Surprised you know how to load that dishwasher, Amazing. You're doing a great job. You're just shuffling plates around. Yeah, yep, shut it, shut it, close it, it's good. Yeah, he did put this open, to be fair. I don't think he put it in the right dish place, though. He probably put it in the, so anyway. I do applaud you for trying that, Lee, but I think you doubled the work for Michelle. There is a learning curve for everything like we talked about. Um, you know, when you adopt any sort of new technology, there's always a learning curve, but the nice thing is actually for Robotics, that learning curve has actually been much smaller than the adoption for some of the things like the stealth navigation. If you look at stealth navigation, one to one and a half years and 30 patients for navigation versus 30 patients and one to 13 patients. So it's, you know, I think people also, it's a different generation. Everybody's grown up with their, their, their iPods, their uh, iPhones. Sorry, that dates me. Uh, their iPhones um, and the computers. So it's a different generation. They're, they adopt this technology way faster. They have that 3D brain that works with the technology that we have to sort of learn. Um, what's the downsides? Affordability, degree of value added. So we, we spend a lot of money on buying these technologies, but is there actually value added to doing that, right? These are not cheap devices. So the adoption is somewhat slow to bring these in, and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, we have to evaluate long-term outcomes. Like I said, we don't have good long-term outcomes for robotic stuff. We know instantaneously what the accuracy is, but that's the only data I've been showing you, right? We don't know the five, 10 years. Does it even matter? I don't know, right? Um, efficiency, you know, does it take much longer to do a robotics case versus a standard case? And then does that reduce the number of cases you can do in a hospital? And does it make you less efficient? And then overall cost. It's got to be a, a, a cost that comes down, not goes up for everything that we do. So what do we know and what do we accept? And I stole this from Dr. Sig Bourbon, who's a, who's a very smart guy out in California. There is a future need for intraoperative navigation in robotics. We know that, okay? That need is variable, though, for the patients and the surgeons. I think that we are undeniable and inescapable trend towards integrating technology into healthcare. We already all know that, okay? If you're not on this bandwagon, you're gonna fall behind. And that's not a reason to join it, but robotics is probably here to stay, and we have to accept that, all right? The design itself, the optimal design, is still evolving, is still to be determined. Like I said, every iteration of the robot is getting better and better, and that's the most important thing. The significance in design, well, 
there are things that, that make some robots better than others, but there's trade-offs. It's like buying a car, right? Why can't I just have everything I want in this car? Why is every piece of this one and this one, right? That's how it is when you buy anything. So future adoption will be dependent upon which of those actually wins the race. In healthcare, though, we can't just say, oh, I want the robot. It, things don't work that way anymore, right? There's a lot of cost containment going on in general. So you have to add value and you have to be cost savings. Those are the most important aspects of any adoption of technology. So we have to improve our benefits and outcomes for our patient. That's the most important thing, no matter what we are doing. And we have to increase the durability of what we do and the outcomes for our patients. But not only that, we have to reduce the price of what we do. I mean, spine surgery in healthcare is way too expensive. You've all seen those graphs, which is crazy. It's not sustainable. The amount of patients to get reoperations, readmissions, we have to reduce that stuff. It's not fair to the patients. It costs money. For a revision surgery, about five years ago, it cost about $32,000. Um, that's expensive, right? There's a real cost to doing that, not only putting a patient under anesthesia, but the risk of infection, things like that. So we have to figure out how we can improve those uh, metrics and outcomes over time. Um, Intraoperative technology, uh, it's, a lot of things are driving this, okay? Obviously, there's surgeon experience. What do we want? The surgical techniques that we're coming out with. We're doing things now that I never learned how to do 10 years ago in my fellowship and training. So we're doing more and more things in better ways, uh, more deformity, more MIS, and then obviously going to change the dynamic of how our ORs are, right? You can't have all this technology in a tiny little closet. We need bigger and bigger spaces to be able to incorporate all this technology. So these are all factors that are important and costly to the hospital. So in general, in conclusion, to hopefully this will answer your guys' questions, you know, it's, it's a pretty promising technology that's out there. Hopefully we can improve where we are today in spine surgery. Uh, I do think that we're going to continue to improve our safety and cost metrics and hopefully utilization will go up. Uh, there's definitely a learning curve, but as you can see that learning curve is getting smaller and smaller for surgeons like us and hopefully as we are doing, collecting data on our outcomes. Okay, we've got to publish data and show that if there's a real value to our patients and not just adopt the technology. So uh, the most important thing is that it doesn't make a bad surgeon good. Okay, some people are too reliant on technology to make them an excellent surgeon. You can take a great surgeon and make them better, but you can't take a terrible surgeon and, and make them any better. And then I'm just going to sort of um, just show you this slide because I don't know what he's doing here. Um, this is at a party and somebody busted him in Birkenstocks and socks. Um, I think that's called the dad shoes, um, but I don't know, maybe that's a new trend. I don't know if this was in Boulder, so I don't know if I'd use that excuse. He lives in Niwot. Um, so future, area of growth, we talked about bone removal, decompressions, um, and then, you know, computer-aided manufacturing for some of these things, 3D renditions of the bone that we're going to do. I talked about sort of the intraoperative robot machine learning, things like that, AI, um, and, you know, getting better and better. So that's really all I have for you. We